All right, um, we're good for the start. The farm of the Ruben Chow, a skull named Kelser into Ardlane Valley of Kia, especially Rodeo Higgins, Stuhorn Sculler, August Thaw Oakhart Fleshora, Ruin in Yah, Tom with the Laur Moorhe, a scholar, a hill on Yah, Martha, a clawlist, a good Richard Sharp, not Myron, August Michal Hoyne. A dowly kela. Be ta an rima darn, go will she linen ya, Argus, um, tasulam gajorship tuish, go no kind sorry. You're all very, very welcome here today uh, at this um, happy but little bit melancholy uh, uh, occasion. We're here on the occasion of the launch of Clolis, the, a major work of scholarship um, compiled by the late Richard Sharp and uh, Michal Hoyne, uh, where uh, it's a joyous occasion uh, to launch uh, a book of this nature, but it's tinged with a little sadness because one of the uh, authors is no longer with us. And we'll hear more about that later on. Ta'an rima daran gor hele an dochter nolago morile an gno yenachon yin chanya ta ana fadagas farshen er nolag mar skolaide Mar lechter, mar uder, agus mar uderas erinleige, and we're singularly fortunate in that Nolico Morella uh, agreed to perform the launch today. Nolic is well known in Ireland and further abroad uh, as a scholar uh, and an authority on Irish, especially in Irish of, of the late medieval and the post-classical periods, to which mo uh, a lot of the work uh, in Plolista. Uh, belongs. Uh, without further ado, then, I will hand over to Nolik uh, to say a few words about, uh, about Clolius, uh, and that will follow, he, he will be followed by the, one of the co-authors, by Michal Hoyne, who will talk about the book itself. So, Gunnar Hillewille, Nolik is food so tall. Gramach to Rudy. Dosso gan buihus le stúr horscan in ein kelchi, Rudy O'Higgin, ta gira clustiagi, as quid a horse them on tall see her intuch shock a hola. It's more agam and frivlid shock. Shen ten who shaffil a wine at ham, erno kite shock, nach will dinner convert agar hoody, Richard Sharp, and shock a lawhead. Ach ta a yawa doj, me al hine, mar holomer, and shock a special ocean or ball jug. Mar mischief on poemanish her on sacks verla or fat pizza. First of all, thank the director. Rudy O'Higgins, whom you've just heard, for inviting me to launch this wonderful book. If ever a work mer merited the designation Magnum Opus, this surely is it. It is a really remarkable volume and a genuine labour of love. For anyone who has not yet seen it, I should mention that it runs to just under 1,300 large pages. Uh, just there, that's the ad. Um, it's, uh, and so, I, first of all, I would say I don't expect to see many people bringing it with them to read on the bus or the train. Before commenting on some aspects of the work, I'll indicate briefly how it is laid out. There are almost 80 pages of preliminary material, including a preface and acknowledgements and a 30 page introduction, together with details of references and abbreviations, a list of auction catalogues and similar sources, a synopsis of Irish types and printers and so on. In what I think is a nice and very appropriate touch, the preliminary material includes an edition of the poem or song Oran Nelyaur by Tomás Rua Osuluain. So you may know it, it begins Gokun Vail Incha Kasume, Kush Goliam Even Darre Agus Marshindo. This tells of how the West Kerry poet lost his library of books when the boat, boat carrying them from Derinan to Port McGee and Ivrahach struck a rock and sank, apparently in the early 1820s. Tomás Rua lists about 30 works in various languages that were lost, and in the edition included in this volume, an effort is made with varying degrees of success to identify those works. Now, moving to the body of the work, Clolius the Proper, uh, the book's subtitle modestly describes it as an attempt at narrative bibliography. 
As the very title claw list uh, indicates, the book is basically a list of all publications in the Irish language that appeared in print in the three centuries after the poem of Pilip Bokta Higgin, Tour Ferriga Fáige Ye, and the book Abigail Gaiga Agus Catechisma by Sean O'Carna were published in Dublin in, in 1571. In fact, there are entries for three works that predate 1571, from 1542, 1555, and 1567, respectively. The first of them, published in London and entitled The First Book of the Introduction of Knowledge, is included because it has, quote, a list of phrases in English and Irish counting to a hundred short sentences, the Irish written phonetically according to English spelling. The second item is of no consequence, but the third is Bishop Sean Carswell's famous translation of John Knox's Book of Common Order, Quirim Nanerni Agus Fastel na Sacramentia Agus Firkidal and Tredge of which, although printed in Edinburgh, was written in literary early modern Irish. Although Clolista is a list of Irish language publications, it is far more than a bare list. While the listing of, is, of course, valuable, the most fascinating aspect of the work for me anyway, is the wonderfully detailed and very knowledgeable commentary. This is the narrative mentioned in the book subtitle. The commentary, which really is a pleasure to read, reminds me of the extensive and quite quirky commentary by Stanish Hayes O'Grady and Robin Flower in their celebrated catalogue of Irish manuscripts in the British Museum, now the British Library. When we move down the list to the beginning of the 17th century, the first item to appear is William Daniel's translation of the New Testament, Jumna Noor Jir Nagzar Slami Hori Isa Priest, which was printed in Dublin in 1602. And we come towards the end of that century, we find that among the last publications in Irish from the 17th century was William Beadle's celebrated translation of the Old Testament, issued in 1685, together with some related works. One of these related works is an edition of Beadle's Bible printed in Roman type for a Gaelic readership in Scotland, sometimes referred to as the Highland Bible. The 18th century saw the publication of a further 137 works, beginning with several catechisms and other religious works by Reverend John Richardson, Church of Ireland Rector in Bell Turbot, County Cavan. Then there's Edward Clude's 112-page uh, Irish Dictionary, which appeared in his Archaeologia Britannica, published in 1707. Other works in the early 17th, of the early 18th century include the Rome re-edition of Unchagos Christi by Bonaventura O'Hosa and various reissues of Dermot O'Connor's General History of Ireland, uh, a controversial, indeed rather notorious because unsatisfactory translation of Shatron Cachin's Boris Bassa Ereiren, which appeared uh, for the first time in 1723. Later in the century, we have Bishop James Gallagher's celebrated Charmonchi, or Sermons, published in 1736, and several catechisms, notably that by Andrew Dunleavy, published in Paris in 1742. 1770 saw the publication of the first number of Collectania de Rebus Hibernicis by the indefatigable and almost invariably wrong-headed Major, later General, Charles Valency. His flow of books and articles continued unabated down to the year 1804. And while most of Valency's own writings can be dismissed out of hand, he occasionally published work by others that merits some attention, such as the account of Westmead written by Henry Pierce in 1682, and some pieces, some pieces by Charles O'Connor of Valnagar. Other more noteworthy works from the period were Joseph Walker's Historical Memoirs of the Irish Bards, and Charlotte Brooks' Relics of Irish Poetry, published in 1786 and 1789, respectively. The first eight decades of the 19th century witnessed a remarkable surge in printed works in Irish, totaling more than 820 books, pamphlets, and leaflets issued between 1800 and the 1870s. You will, I'm sure, be relieved to learn that I will not go through these in detail. I just mentioned some that were indisputably of significance. First is the famous pious miscellany of Timothy O'Sullivan, or also known, of course, as Thay Gaelic O'Sullivan, one of the most notable Irish language bestsellers ever. A detailed study by Richard Sharp concluded that the number of editions of this book in pre-famine Ireland may have been, quote, as high as 27, and indeed there are three more from the post-famine decades. 
1820 was published what Claude Lister describes as Edward O'Reilly's only important publication. That is the Transactions of the Iberno Celtic Society for 1820, containing a chronological account of nearly 400 Irish writers. The first half of the 19th century saw a veritable avalanche of religious publications. These were books, pamphlets, and leaflets issued in support of the proselytizing activities of the Bibloidi, the evangelical missionaries who were busy seeking to spread Protestantism, especially in the Irish speaking West uh, of Ireland. This spate of publishing melted away in the second half of the century, with no more than two dozen items published in the quarter century after the famine. James Hardiman's two volume Irish minstrelsy issued in 1831 was, despite its shortcomings, a significant development. It was, in the words of Brandon O'Bohala, the first major comprehensive anthology of Irish verse. It is when we reach the early 1840s, however, that publications in the Irish language move on to a different plane with the arrival on the scene of John O'Donovan. While some short pieces of his had appeared in the Dublin Penny Journal in the early 1830s, it was with the steady stream of books and editions that came from his pen between 1842 and the end of the decade that O'Donovan really made an impact. These were just six of them. Fla Dunangay Agus Cochmuy Ra in 1842, the following year, the tribes and customs of Haimani or Iwana um, in 1844, genealogies, tribes and customs of Iachrach. Then uh, the year after that, 1845, a grammar of the Irish language, and in 1847, Yaur And then between 1848 and 51, his magnissimum opus, the seven volume Anala Riachta Aaron, the Annals of the Four Masters. I'd say at this point that if you wish to get a flavour of what awaits you on opening Clolista, you could do worse than read the entries on those six works, as well as on two other books by O'Donovan, Three Fragments of Irish Annals, published in 1860, and Topographical Poems of John O'Dogan and Gillan Lee Bohirian, which came out just after O'Donovan's death, in 18, uh, it came out in 1862. The sheer amount of detail that the editors of Polista have set out clearly and concisely in each of these entries is simply breathtaking. Having spoken about Donovan, I should mention, if only briefly, the work of his close colleague Eugene O'Curry, whose best-known work, Lectures on the Manuscript Materials of Ancient Irish History, was published in 1861. His other major work on the manners and customs of the ancient Irish, published posthumously, lies outside the purview of Polista. To conclude this brief outline of Clolista's contents, I note that apart from some items deemed undated and undatable, the final uh, work listed is uh, entitled Mediae Noctis Concilium. This you will no doubt recognize as a Latin version of the title of Brian Merriman's Coach and Verniche. This, the earliest printed version of the famous poem, is apparently dated 1879. Now, Clolista is rounded off with an index of first lines of the poems mentioned in the volume, running at a rough, a rough estimate to over 1,200 separate items, followed by a 13-page bibliographical index and a general index of over 70 pages. Bileanaurus akorabinta kujoan sihere shoch is dochretje on mege olish at habali agus korhe nagar ijagatlu da kanyaur heger her shoch. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about Clolista is that it is so very readable. It's not at all like a bibliography, um, which, with uh, respect to, due respect to my bibliographical friends, may contain useful details but can often be quite a chore to plough through. On virtually every page of Clo Lister, there's some fascinating snippet of information, amounting in all to thousands of interesting and often intriguing details, carefully researched, checked, and set down, a labor that must have taken countless hours of exhausting work by the co-editors. Perhaps Michal will give us some idea of how he and Richard Sharp divided up the work. This brings to mind that today's celebration of the publication of this wonderful work is indeed, as Rory mentioned earlier, tinged with sadness since Richard is no longer with us. It's more than 30 years since I first made his acquaintance. In 1989, if memory serves me right, at a get-together in Kim and Catherine's house in Maynooth after a medievalist conference. 
After that, our paths crossed from time to time, usually at conferences such as the Celtic Congress in Edinburgh in 1995. The first time we did some work together, mainly via email, was when he was preparing his superb edition of Roderick O'Flaherty's Letters, which was published in 2013. That gave me an insight into his modus operandi. He was, tire he was tireless in pursuit of the most minute details and ever anxious to ensure their accuracy, as will be obvious to anyone who looks at his voluminous footnotes in the O'Flaherty book. For example, page 354, uh, which has eight lines of main text and 42 lines of footnotes, reminiscent of O'Donovan's uh, annotation of the Annals of War Masters. I once mentioned to him various references by O'Flaherty to the difficulties, especially the cost, that the Galway author experienced when sending and receiving letters to and from England and Scotland, circa 1700. A couple of days later, Richard sent me by email quite a detailed dissertation on the postal system as it operated three centuries ago, citing numerous sources, including references to sections of the Post Office Act 1660. He later converted that piece into a number of lengthy footnotes on pages 77 and 78 of the, the book. I still find it hard at times to realise that Richard isn't contactable by email. About a year and a half ago, I was struggling with a Latin passage in the Annals of Clon MacNoise. Most of the passage was straightforward enough, but there was a phrase whose meaning defeated me, so I sent it to Richard to get his opinion. Fifty minutes later, he replied with his own translation of the whole passage, which happily was largely in line with what I had produced, except for the problematical phrase. For that, he had a row of question marks and a note declaring that it was simply gobbledygook and impossible to restore. When he was working on Claude Lister, he sent me queries from time to time. Sometimes when I turned on my computer in the morning, I would find that the query had been sent at, say, 3.40 a.m. Some of the queries would require a one-line response, but Richard's acknowledgement was usually even more cryptic. One that I received more than once was T R, that is T on one line and R immediately below it, the meaning being, thanks, Richard. Once, uh, on one occasion, I joked that if he were trying to save ink, I would understand it. And his reply was, no, but it saves time. I last saw him before the arrival of COVID-19. Um, I had dropped into the RIA reading room and seeing him sitting at the table typing into a small laptop, I spoke to him and because we were both getting rather hard of hearing, we decided to adjourn to the academy um, hallway to have a brief chat. He told me he was going back to Oxford next day, but that he intended to be back in Dublin shortly in about two weeks after that, shortly after Patrick's day. He said Clolius was nearly complete, but he had some additional material to insert, and the publisher, as he termed them, was insisting the book should not go above a thousand pages. As he did not want to remove anything that was in it, the only alternative would be to reduce the font size, some of it, if I recall rightly, down to nine point. That would mean, he said, that he would be unable to read his own text without the aid of a magnifying glass. Anyway, he said he would be back in a couple of weeks with all his arguments properly marshaled. We agreed to meet up when he returned, but alas, that was not to happen. I should add that the book is also superb from the point of view of design, layout and print. It really is an elegant work. And Richard will no doubt be pleased that his fears about print size or restricted pagination were not realised. The School of Celtic Studies of the Dublin Institute deserves great credit for publishing this extraordinary volume, one of the greatest works of learning to be published in Ireland in recent times. But the greatest credit is merited by the co-editors and in the absence of Richard, Michal must take a bow. This great book will be a fitting monument to Richard's memory for ages to come. Incidentally, I found only a single tiny misprint in the entire volume at the bottom of uh, uh, page 1038, if you want to look, simply number written with an M at the beginning. Before I finish, I should draw attention to an item of very good news that is modestly hidden away in the very first footnote in the book. 
This announces that another work of Richard's, Irish Manuscript Sales, about which he waxed eloquent to me on several occasions, is, we are told, at an advanced stage and that it is hoped to make it available to a wider audience in the near future. Agsan Jash Gaelishin in our glossa, Fogriam and Yawr Intakshaw, Cholista, Ebe Falchaha, Agus Sholtha, Scotcher, Agus Lechere, Cogardus, Legachtine, Be Banchoklesh, Gurmahagi. Gurumila Mahatasin and Olak, thank you very, very much uh, for that uh, excellent uh, introduction to, to Cholista, and uh, you've enthused everyone uh, about it. Uh, and as I mentioned, um, one of the villains of the piece is with us today, uh, and that is the, uh, uh, the, the co-author, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Michal Hoyne. So, Fagama Futsa e Vihil Marshan, Shalaf. Kuzmil Magataruri, and thank you very much, Nodig, for that beautiful account of Clolis and indeed of Richard, and no better man to give a whistle-stop tour of three centuries of Irish printing than yourself, so it's very much appreciated. It is unfortunate but unavoidable that for some time now, for reasons with which we are all familiar, book launches have had to be online affairs. I don't know if anyone has written a history of the book launch, Richard Sharp would have been the man, but so far as I can make out, the book launch is a public occasion at which a new book is presented to the world and declared to be for sale is a very modern thing. The earliest example of the term book launch in the OED is from 1964. The phrase to launch a book is older, but originally meant simply to publish a book. In any event, in thinking about what I might say today, I have been browsing Clolista and imagining what sort of book launch might have accompanied some of the publications catalogued there. If a launch had been organized in 1817 to mark the publication of Edward O'Reilly's Irish English Dictionary, it would probably have been a rather frosty affair. In his preface, O'Reilly criticizes all and sundry and says he has but few obligations to confess. True, he received a little money from a few supporters, but as far as assistance towards compiling the dictionary itself is concerned, he declares that with one solitary exception, he has no one to thank among the living. He does strike a somewhat more positive note as he goes on though, saying, if my acknowledgements to the living be few, I am ready to confess my obligations to the dead. And he praises his predecessor uh, lexicographers and the librarians who assisted him in his work. In contrast to poor Edward O'Reilly, the list of people to be thanked for their assistance on this occasion is an arm long. And I won't try your patience by reading out the list of acknowledgements that appears in the final product, thanking the school, readers, scholars who sent us uh, uh, information. But I would like to single out a few people for special praise. Before doing that, however, I would like to take this opportunity to apologize to anyone omitted from the acknowledgements. If you facilitated a visit to your library, answered a query, shared your research, or assisted in any other way, and find that your name is not mentioned there, it says more about my memory than our appreciation, or lack thereof, for your help. Edward O'Reilly singled out librarians for special praise, and it is only right and proper that I should do the same. This is a librarian's book, a book about the Irish language collections held in modern libraries and in libraries that no longer are. And it is a book that could not have been attempted without the cooperation and support of librarians and archivists. Even the list of librarians mentioned in the acknowledgements is too long for me to read out here, but I must express our particular gratitude to the librarians in the Royal Irish Academy, the National Library, early printed books in TCD, special collections in UCD, and the School of Celtic Studies in the Dublin Institute. In particular, Sophie, Constantine, and all the team in the Academy made this work possible. In the National Library, Amaira Nihonalain went above and beyond the call of duty in assisting Richard and myself, and Eugene and Evelyn in UCD were unfailingly helpful. We have fantastic staff in the school's own library, of course. Margaret Irons not only made every facility available to us there, she also helped create the beautiful cover. I would like too to pay special tribute to the many part-time, trainee, intern and volunteer librarians in various institutions who gave so generously of their precious time and expertise without even a permanent contract or anything like secure employment. Leaving the library, I am delighted to be able to publicly thank Dr. Andrew McCarthy, who is with us, 
Andy not only provided technical assistance at every stage of this work, and, and believe me, we needed a lot of it, he also typeset this large and complicated book under difficult circumstances and did a marvellous job. Uh, the quality of his work speaks for itself. It is no exaggeration to say that this book would not have appeared were it not for the school administrator, Eileen Nikonacha. She arranged accommodation for Richard on his many trips to Dublin. She did everything she could to make our lives easier when we were working hammer and tongs at the manuscript. She shepherded Qual Lista from submission through revisions into proofs. She dealt with the printer and she designed that stunning cover. She promoted the book and along with Pauline at the front desk in the Institute, she is the one who literally sends it out to those who order it. And it's heavy. Any of these things would earn her a glowing mention today, but I'm not done. Work on this book, particularly in the final stages, was intense and was carried out during a difficult period. The loss of Richard was not just a professional loss for me, it was also a deeply personal one. Attempting to revise Quo Lista without my Lachvodoit, a friend and colleague with whom I had been in daily contact for three years, whose personality and erudition is imprinted on every page, whose knowledge and insight are irreplaceable, was no easy thing. Trying to do this under lockdown without access to libraries and dealing with the major and minor catastrophes of life during that strange time was difficult. Eileen kept my spirits up, made sure I was doing all right and inspired me to finish the work. I am enormously in her debt. In the same breath, I would like to thank most sincerely my partner, Stephen, and those friends and colleagues who provided much needed moral support. I won't forget it. Working on Qual Lista with Richard was a marvellous adventure. When Richard recruited me in 2017, I had no idea what to expect. I pleaded with him that I was no expert on Irish language print material. He responded that no one really was, but we were both prepared to do the work, to familiarise ourselves with the material and to seek out the experts. And we both believed in the importance of this fundamental research. Plus, he said, it'll be fun. And it was hard work, but fun. Richard was a generous teacher and I learned an enormous amount from him. We spent many busy days during his trips to Ireland, poring over books in various libraries and drafting each entry together, trying to discover the individual story of each item and to see the broader picture of which it is a part. Richard was a truly insightful historian, though he would always jokingly protest that he was not a proper historian, being too interested in real things. He had a deep understanding of books as material objects and as human achievements. He delighted in the whole story of a book. For him, it was not just a chapter in the life of the writer. The publisher too is part of the story, as is the printer, the financial backer, the bookseller, the binder, eventually the reader, the critic, the plagiarist, the collector, the librarian, the scholar, and on and on. Clolista is an attempt to tell all these stories, or at least to provide material to tell them. This is why it is a book and not a website. It is more than a collection of searchable facts and minutia. It should not be imagined that the writing of this book was entirely a sedentary task. Among my fondest memories are the two of us climbing up ladders or crawling around on all fours, looking for lost boxes of catechisms or missing primers. Richard was a great believer in getting out of the office. And lucky for me, he also believed that valuable thought work can be done in the pub after a day spent at the coalface. Because of the sheer variety of stuff catalogued in Clo Lista, from the Fear Volug to Botany, Elissa's editions of the Midnight Course to Tracts on the Immaculate Conception, it's all in there, we were quite a puzzle to the regulars in the now defunct Leeson Lounge, one of whom, after eavesdropping on our conversation for some time, was finally moved to ask, what the hell do you two do? When we were under pressure to meet deadlines and my motivation was flagging, Richard would conjure up the image of the finished product in our hand and invite me to imagine the two of us raising a glass to a job well done. I like to think he's raising a glass in the great pub in the sky today. I pay a proper tribute to Richard elsewhere, particularly for my fellow ECRs, to use the awful term. I would like to take this opportunity to emphasize two things about the man, his curiosity and his courage. Richard believed in finding out about things in an almost childlike way, and he could not conceive of waiting around for someone else to do the work. 
if he needed to learn modern Irish to read a 1940s master's thesis from UCC so he could find out about catechisms, well, that's what he'd do. If he needed to ask for help, he would, though there were few things Richard could master if he applied himself. Without ever being disrespectful to the material he was working on, he believed the most important thing was to start working, to make progress, to get a draft together. We aim for perfection, but know it's impossible. There are mistakes in Clolista, besides the uh, misprint noted by Mullick. As time goes by, I'll endeavour to correct them. Please keep an eye out for a supplement. No one can really be expert in all the material catalogued and discussed. But we believed, and I still believe, that mapping this largely unexplored landscape is worthwhile. We might have planned to spend 10 years exploring the terrain before going into print, and the work would still be imperfect and incomplete. But we would have fallen out of love with the project and perhaps missed the chance to reach some interested readers. Of course, fate intervened in any event. Clolista is the first word on much of this material. The last thing either Richard or myself would wish is that it should be the last. This year, I had the great pleasure of teaching a new course to Sofferster students in the Irish department in TCD about the history of the Irish language in print. As part of this, the students were asked to engage directly with primary material, to describe it, to ask fundamental questions about it, to think about the whole story behind these items. I hope they enjoyed the experience. It was very inspiring for me seeing them do much the same thing Richard and myself did in compiling Clolista. I found myself chomping at the bit to do more work on the material the students and I were discussing together. Hopefully with Clolista to guide, and sometimes maybe to lead astray, but always I hope down interesting paths, more research will be carried out into the print heritage of the Irish language. There is certainly no shortage of work. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations on the publication and thank you very much for the very warm memories and the tribute uh, you've paid to our late friend uh, Richard, who is very sadly missed here. That more or less concludes it, but my life wouldn't be worth living if I didn't pass on a message to you from the formidable Eileen. And that is that even at 50 euros uh, for, a, uh, for a work of such scholarship, uh, and such an extent, uh, Clolist is a snip. But we'll snip even further, and Eileen has ordained that from now on to the 23rd uh, of this month, it'll be available for a, the special price of 30 euros. And if you go on our website uh, and order it there, uh, as Michal said, both Eileen and Pauline will ensure that it reaches you very soon. So let's in a card Fogum with Slong come uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Andrew McCarthy, who's behind the scenes there, pulling all the strings and making sure we did everything, and not just for this, but for the wonderful work he does in our publications on ISOS and so many other different things uh, at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Eileen as well uh, for organization and to thank Nullick uh, for being so willing. Uh, to come to us and to prepare uh, a wonderful uh, launch uh, speech and to uh, give us such an account uh, uh, of the work. And once again, uh, congratulations to Michal. And we all remember uh, Richard as we, uh, as we depart. And not a father may it not be long until we can launch and have such events uh, in person and uh, talk again. Uh, as we as we used to. But thank you all for coming here today. August Leshin, Fogama Slongovi. Good to meet him. Slongish.